difficulty that you're going through. You dwell in darkness. You dwell in complete opposition. The city that you live in is the city of anti-Christ. Revelation chapter 2, beginning there in verse 12 down through 17, is Jesus' address to the church of Pergamum. You remember the setting in which John is receiving this message. He is receiving this message in a vision from God as he's been carried along by the Holy Spirit and he's having a vision of the risen Christ. Now, this is not the lowly Christ that he's having a vision of, is it? No, this is the magnified, glorified, magnificent Christ there in all of his glory in heaven. He's got the stars, the seven stars. Those are the messengers, the angels of the churches in his right hand. And he is walking in the midst of the seven lampstands. He's walking in the midst of the church. And we want God to be in our midst. We want Christ to be in our midst. And that's where the Bible says he is. He's walking in the midst of those seven lampstands. And we've already addressed a couple of churches at this point, two churches, Ephesus and Smyrna. Tonight we are looking at the third church. Uh, the third church in Revelation 2 through 3, chapters 2 through 3, address seven churches. Now, this is a message for all of the churches. As you see at the end of the message to each one of the seven churches, uh, there's a commendation given to all the churches. Okay? He who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So this is a message not just for Pergamum. We looked at the message to Smyrna and Ephesus. That's not just a message for Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamum. Those are messages for us. It's a message for all of the churches. It addresses specific situations that what they went through, but as we've seen through the weeks, there are universal principles that apply to us, and, and we'll see some of those here tonight, Lord willing. You look in verse 12, it says, And to the angel of the church in Pergamum, right. Now, I'm not going to belabor the point, but what does it mean to say, and to the angel of the church in Pergamum? Essentially, over the weeks, we've addressed that there are probably two options, two interpretive options here for what angel means. In the book of Ezekiel, uh, in fact, you see that an angel could very well be referencing an angel, this supernatural being, maybe the Lord has assigned an angel to each of his churches as a guardian over those churches. We have seen, in fact, in the book of Ezekiel, as I've referenced, we've seen that there is an angel that represents Persia. There's an angel that represents Greece. Those are bad angels. Those are demons. And you see Michael waging war against them. Could the Lord have assigned an angel to each of the churches? Sure. Sure he could. Could the Lord have assigned an angel to us as Hillcrest Baptist Church? Sure he could. Sure he could. And we, we ought not be so earthly that we deny heavenly things. But the text isn't so specific. It could also mean the pastors. It could mean the literal physical pastors there in the church. It could mean someone like myself, messenger of the church. So... Jesus is giving the message to John. John sends the message on that trade route through Asia Minor as it goes clockwise there. He sends the message, and the pastor of the church is to go verse by verse, I would argue. He's to go through those messages to the people. He's to deliver that message to them, okay? And all the churches are to have the same message. So it could be either. It could be an angelic being, or it could just be the basic meaning of an angel, a messenger, or an envoy, Okay, a pastor. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum, right. Now, we don't know where Pergamum is because we live in America, but Pergamum is in modern-day Turkey. It is about 65 miles north of Smyrna, which is just about 15 or 20 miles north of Ephesus, and all of that may not make any sense to you, and that's okay. You can go look at a map later, but it's not too far off of the Aegean Sea. This is in Asia Minor. This was an area ruled by Rome during the Pax Romana, where Rome essentially had peace over the whole world, but it wasn't, it wasn't so much peace as it was um, oppression. Don't step up against Rome or we're going to crush you. Okay, 
That was, that was what the Pax Romana was characterized by. Pergamum was, um, was an administrative city for Rome. In 29 BC, Augustus actually had a temple. He commissioned a temple or he approved a temple to be built there in Pergamum for the specific purpose of emperor worship. And as far back as five centuries before Jesus, we can see through history that Pergamum actually embraced a ruler worship. So whoever was their governor or their king, and then when Rome comes in, the emperor, they worshipped that person as a, as a deity. And as, as I said, as far back as five centuries before Christ, the rulers of Pergamum would actually refer, they would demand that people refer to them as God and as Savior. And they mean that. They mean, I am the Savior of this city. If it weren't for me, the city would perish. So you worship me as God and as Savior. More than that, Pergamum was also a center of idolatry, of pagan worship. There was a temple to Athena there. And in front of the temple of Athena, you had a 40-foot statue. A 40-foot statue, not so much a statue as it was an altar. A 40-foot altar. Imagine how big that is. A 40-foot tall altar to Zeus. But to be more specific, the altar was not just to Zeus, it was to Zeus Soter, which comes from the Greek word where we get our word soteriology. Soteriology means the doctrine of salvation. So when they say that this altar is to Zeus Soter, what are they saying about Zeus? Zeus, our Savior. Okay, this is a center of idolatry, a center of paganism. Not only did they have emperor worship there and worship to Zeus and worship to Athena, but they also had famously, and you'll find this fascinating, and it really is, and you should, you should research this on your own. You'll, you'll see some things that are really neat, but I say neat in a, in a strange way. But they had a temple there that was also a hospital. They had a temple and a hospital, and that temple and hospital was to the, the pagan god, the pagan idol, Asclepius. See if I say that right. Asclepius. The symbol for that god, the symbol for that idol that they worshipped, was actually two snakes interwoven on a pole. You seen that symbol before? Okay, you see that on doctor's jackets and you see that at hospitals. That is the same exact symbol. That's where that comes from. And it originated there, there in Pergamum. It was a huge cult. It wasn't just medicine, okay? This was a cult of worship. This was a cult, a healing cult. And this was a center. Pergamum was a center of that cult. So that's a little bit about this city. It was known for its parchment. It was known for its production of parchment. There's a Spanish word that sounds a lot like Pergamum. It means parchment. Miss Allison would probably know that word. Um, Pergamum is where we get our English word for parchment. So that was probably what they produced in mass. It said that Pergamum had a library that had over 200,000 volumes. Imagine that. 200,000 volumes before the printing press. This was a formidable city, to say the least. So verse 12 says, And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, The words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. The words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 16, Jesus refers to himself as this, or he's referred to as this, as the one who has the sword coming out of his mouth. What a powerful image. Undoubtedly refers to the words of God, to the words of God in that they are active, they are cutting. And so you recall Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, for the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and it's able to divide joint and marrow, soul and spirit, and it is the judge of the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. And it has the idea, this sword coming out of the mouth of Christ, that what he speaks comes to pass. 
That what he speaks is cutting, it is biting, it is divisive, and it is decisive, in fact. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 29, God says this about his own word. He says, is not my word like fire? Everything fire touches, it affects. Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord? And like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. See, God's word is very different from our words, right? We speak a lot of empty words. A lot of words that don't mean much or that we shouldn't say. But every time God speaks a word, he actually accomplishes exactly what he set forth to do with that word. That's that picture there of the, the sword coming out of the mouth of Christ. I want you to think about how authoritative that that image is. That's a warring type image. That's an image of deity, that God's words accomplish what they set for. But it's also a very comforting thought, isn't it? He's writing to the church in Pergamum, as we're going to see, they live where Satan's throne is. One of their own slaughtered before their very eyes. They are living under the oppression of the Roman sword. And yet Jesus says, I'm the one who has the sword coming out of his mouth. You may be living under the oppression of Rome for a temporary period of time, but there will come a time, even us, where we will reside under the power and the authority of God. And we look forward to that day where Jesus rules over all the world. And that would have been an enormously comforting fact, enormously comforting word given to the church in Pergamum about Jesus, about their Lord, especially in light of what they are going through. Look at verse 13. He says, I know where you dwell. Seems like he started off every message to these churches by telling them what he knows. God knows all. God knows where we dwell. God knows what we do. God knows what's going on inside the church. God knows what happens behind closed doors and in the dark. And doesn't Jesus say that whatever you say in the dark, it's going to be shouted on the rooftops. The fact is, God knows. I know your or where you dwell where Satan's throne is. What could he possibly mean? I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. A number of possibilities could mean that he's talking about the fact that Pergamum is a center of ruler worship, of emperor worship, paganism, idolatry. They have a a 40-foot altar dedicated to Zeus Soter, somebody claiming to be They're Christ, somebody claiming to be their God. He's really a false God, though. We know that all the idols are directed to worship towards Satan. Could he be talking about that? Could he be talking about this healing temple, this hospital, this snake worship? Could he be talking about that? Or could he probably just be referring to all of it together? Pergamum is such a dark city, spiritually, That when you go there, you are in the presence of Satan. The thing about Rome is that Rome would demand the same kind of allegiance that Jesus would demand, wouldn't it? Rome would demand that you worship the emperor... You worship the emperor alone. You are allegiant to Rome, and you are allegiant to Rome alone. Christians, you leave your religious beliefs at home. Don't bring them in the public sphere. Don't bring them where everyone else is. And this is for the good of the state. And if you bring your religion into the public sphere, and it gets in the way of what Rome is going to do, Rome will crush it, just as they did with Antipas when they killed him in the presence of the church. One of the things that I find very interesting, especially as I studied this text, is that rapidly, very rapidly, this country that we live in demands the same thing. Now, in this country, to be an American means you don't bring your religion into the public sphere. 
meaning you don't influence the schools, you don't influence the state, you don't influence the federal government with your religion. You keep that in private, and that would be for the good of us all, for the good of the state. And if you're going to be a good American, don't bring your Christian values, don't bring your biblical values into the state. You just leave them at home. Don't bring them into the secular world. More and more, our country embraces the same type of demand for allegiance that Rome did. More and more, this country looks like the throne of Satan. More and more, this world looks like the throne of Satan. Leave religion at home. Leave Jesus at home for the good of us all. So he says, I know where you dwell where Satan's throne is. I know the difficulty that you're going through. You dwell in darkness. You dwell in complete opposition. The city that you live in is the city of anti-Christ. Yet, the word is chi, it means and or yet. And yet you hold fast my name and you did not deny my faith. What a commendation. You live where Satan dwells, where his throne dwells. And yet in the midst of that, you hold fast to the name of Christ. Whereas your city would demand allegiance to the emperor, allegiance to these false gods, you refuse to deny my name. You refuse to deny my faith, and you are willing to stand up and say, I belong to Christ. I would pray that we would have the same thing said about us. I would pray that we would operate in the same way, that no matter how much this world would demand that we be allegiant to the world, that we would remain committed unto death to Christ, that we would continue to name his name. He says, you dwell in the midst of where Satan's throne is, and yet you won't quit calling yourself a Christian. You won't quit naming the name of Christ. You did not deny my faith. And he turns the screws here. Even more so, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful martyr, my faithful witness is what the word means who was killed among you where Satan dwells. We know really nothing about the death of Antipas other than what was stated here. But from this verse, we can see a couple of things. Antipas was obviously a faithful preacher of God's word. He was a martyr. He was a witness. And he was killed where? In their midst. Maybe this was an act of intimidation, saying, we're going to kill your preacher. We're going to kill the faithful witness. We're going to kill the one who won't stop talking about Christ with the hopes that all the rest of the people will stop. But Jesus says, I'm going to commend you for this, that even after they killed Antipas in your midst, even after they snuffed him out, you would not stop. You would not deny my name. You stayed faithful to name the name of Christ, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful servant who was killed among you where Satan dwells. Verse 14, but, but. We've gone over this a number of times. There's a couple of words in the Greek, a couple of adversative particles that you can use to draw contrast. One is day, and the other is, you know what? It's the word Allah, okay? A-L-L-A is the way it would be translated there. But it is a way of drawing extreme contrast. It's a way of saying, you need to pay attention to this. And essentially what he's doing here is saying this, I know you're living where Satan dwells, where his throne is, and I know you won't deny my name. You continue to acknowledge the name of Christ, but something is drastically wrong. Something is very wrong, even though you won't stop naming the name of Christ. Something is drastically wrong here. But I have a few things, a couple of things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel. A little bit of study about Balaam. If you 
when you study at home later tonight, Numbers chapter 22 through 24 tells you about this incident between Balak and Balaam. Balak was the king of Moab. He was the king of the Moabites. And he had heard about Israel, this vagabond horde, okay, coming through the wilderness, coming through the Canaan wilderness. And as they are wandering through the wilderness at this point, they are defeating the enemies of God. They are enacting his justice on a world that was adamantly opposed to God. And so the Moabites heard about this, this group of Israelites who are coming through, and they're wiping out everybody in their path. And Balak, the king of Moab, become very fearful about this because his city was next. His kingdom was next. And so what he did was he said, I'm going to go find a prophet or at least somebody who calls themselves a prophet, somebody who has the ability to pronounce a curse, a supernatural curse over the Israelites to stop them in their tracks so that when they war against Moab, they won't be successful because we won't be able to handle them unless they're cursed. So he goes and finds Balaam. He sends an emissary. He sends a a group of people, okay, honorable people. And he sends them to Balaam. He said, Balaam, will you curse Israel for me? So Balaam goes and he prays to the Lord. He's obviously praying to Yahweh. He's praying to Jehovah. And the Lord says, you can't curse somebody that I've blessed. So you just tell them that. So Balaam goes back and says, look, Balak, you you just tell Balak this, that no matter how much honor you send my way, no matter how much money you send my way, I can't go further than what the Lord commands. I can't curse somebody that God has blessed. So they go back to Balak, and Balak says, I know what I'll do. I'll up the ante. And so he sends back even more honorable people and even more money this time. And they come to Balaam. Balaam sees what they have and says, look, I told you I can't go further than what the Lord said, but I'll go pray about it again. Apparently that was too much. You only need to hear from God one time and it's good enough. He goes back and he prays and God says, okay, Balaam, you do what you want to do. You go, but you only do what I'm going to tell you to do. And on his way, they have an interaction where he's riding his donkey and the angel of the Lord stops them in an alley and the donkey stops and he falls back. Okay, and Balaam's about to hit the donkey, and the donkey starts talking to him. Very peculiar event. In fact, that's what's happening tonight. Donkey's talking to you. <laughs> A very interesting event, though. The donkey rebukes Balaam. A lot of times, donkeys have a whole lot more sense than false prophets, right? So the donkey's speaking to Balaam, says, why are you hitting me? Have I ever done this all your life, all my life? Have I ever treated you this way? No. The angel of the Lord suddenly opens Balaam's eyes and he sees that angel there. And he said, I was about to kill you if that donkey hadn't stopped. And I would have spared the donkey. So he lets Balaam go and says, you better not say a word past what I tell you. Balaam issues four oracles as he looks over the people of Israel. And each one of these four oracles, he blesses the people of Israel And each one of those times, Balak is sitting there listening. He's like, here comes the curse. Here comes the curse. And Balaam blesses them, and he's furious. And he says, hold on. Let me go take you to another mountain where you can see Israel. And let's try this again. Four times he does that. And four times Balaam blesses the people of Israel. So you might say, well, what was Balaam's sin? What is the teaching of Balaam? Because it sounds like Balaam did what God wanted him to do. Other than Balaam being greedy in the first instance where he went back and he prayed twice what is the sin of Balaam what is the teaching of Balaam that these people are going after here because in Numbers 22 through 24 you don't really see that but if you keep reading in Numbers 25 Balaam is kind of out of the picture but in Numbers 25 you see that the Israelites begin to participate in paganism and in idolatry, and you know who they're participating in idolatry and immorality and paganism with? The daughters of Moab. The daughters of Moab. And in Numbers chapter 31, uh, verse 15 and 16, we're actually told exactly what happened. We're told that Balaam wouldn't curse the people of God, but what he did was he turned aside... And he spoke to Balak after that last blessing, and he said, Look, Balak, I can't curse the people of God, but you can get them to curse themselves. 
If you'll find the most beautiful women you have in your people and you'll send them among the Israelites, the Israelites will lust after those women. They'll begin to marry those women and they'll embrace their gods. And when they embrace paganism, God will kill them. Oh, because Balaam was greedy. Balak had brought such great money. He had been so heavily invested in Balaam that Balaam said, look, I'll give you a piece of advice here, buddy. Just send your women and they'll be your downfall. So he does that and Israel falls greatly. The sin with the Baal of Peor there in Numbers 25. So, back to Revelation 2, that's what he's talking about. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam. They hold the teaching of immorality and idolatry. The sons of Israel who fornicated there with the Moabite women and embraced their gods because they embraced those pagan people. They're unequally yoked with people who don't love God. And friend, I will tell you that. That will happen. Some of our youth, you may be looking for a spouse. You will be here before too long. If you unequally yoke yourself with somebody who does not love God, believe me, you probably won't bring them up. And if you want proof, just go read Numbers 25. So the people of Israel or the people here in Pergamum, just like the people of Israel, had embraced. Some of them had embraced the teaching of Balaam. They had, they had said, okay, it's okay to have a little bit of the world. It's okay to, to marry into the world. It's okay to, to worship with our wives or to worship with our husbands, those gods that are not Yahweh, those gods that are not Jesus. So look what he says. He actually reveals what he's talking about. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block, that's the Moabite women, before the sons of Israel, so that, why do they hold the teaching of Balaam? So that they might eat food, sacrifice to idols, and practice sexual immorality. They embrace the teaching of Balaam so that they can justify their sin, is what they do. So also, verse 15, you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. We talked about that a little bit. Nicholas was supposedly one of the disciples who was appointed there in Acts chapter 6. And he had gone apostate and he started teaching what's called Gnostic gospel. He started teaching that there is a separation between the spiritual and the physical. That God is spiritual and everything done physically doesn't matter. It's really just a complicated way of saying you can do whatever you want to do with your body. God doesn't care because God's spirit. So in both of these instances, what are they doing? They're justifying their immorality. They're justifying their mingling with the world. They're justifying their idolatry. At least some of them are. In both cases, they have thrown off restraint. They have cast off restraint. They've cast off the law of God on themselves and embraced immorality. So all these people are suffering greatly. I I could maybe see how they could do that, maybe some people would say. Well, they're suffering greatly, and I'll tell you this. It is a great temptation for everyone in this room to watch out for. That when you suffer greatly, you will be tempted to say, well, what else matters? They're killing people in front of me, or this person passed away, or this terrible thing happened to me. Nothing else matters, so I'm just going to do whatever my body wants. That's a real temptation. That's a very serious temptation. And I don't think I even have to dive into that too deep to talk about when there's a terrible car accident, how many people become alcoholics? Or how many people become adulterous? Or how many people's families are wrecked because they suffer greatly and they use that as a justification to sin? Suffering is not an excuse for immorality. Suffering is not an excuse for idolatry. It's not an excuse to worship your body. Distress, 
Distress in your family, distress on your person, distress in your nation is not authorization to dismiss holiness. Distress does not authorize the dismissal of holiness. Apparently, it's very serious to God. It's very serious to Jesus because look at the threat that he issues here. Verse 16, therefore, repent. Metanoia is the word. You change your mind. Change your mind, which leads to a change of action. That's what it means. Repent. Think differently and act differently. Therefore, repent. Stop doing what you're doing. You tell those people among you who are embracing the teaching of Balaam, who are embracing the Gnostic gospel of the Nicolaitans, you tell them to stop. You tell them to quit walking in immorality, quit walking in idolatry. If not, here's the conditional statement. This is how serious God takes immorality and idolatry. If not, I will come to you. Who's you? It's the church. Not the world. He's talking about the church. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them. Interesting wording there. Church, I will come to you and I will hunt out those people who are embracing the teaching of Balaam and the Nicolaitans. I will come to you swiftly and quickly. So essentially what I think Jesus is telling John here to tell the church of Pergamum is this. You have immorality in your church. You have people who are naming the name of Christ, and yet they go out of here and they walk in immorality. They walk in idolatry. And so I'm warning you, you better take care of this issue before I do. You better handle it before God does. Friends, God does not tolerate idolatry in his church. He doesn't tolerate immorality in his church. If there's anything that we see from Matthew chapter 18 when Jesus teaches us about church discipline is that when there is sin going on in the church, it needs to be corrected. And what this text tells me is that it gets to a point where if sin continues to dwell in the church and the church doesn't deal with it, that God will. It's a very stern warning that the church better be in the world, but they better not be of the world because God will not tolerate it. You see, Jesus doesn't doesn't dismiss the requirement of holiness just because the people in Pergamum are dwelling where Satan's throne is. Can you imagine a greater stress than that? There's no greater distress than that for a Christian. And yet Jesus demands the highest holiness from these people. So friend, don't ever try to justify your sin because, well, I was just depressed or, well, I got upset or, well, I got mad or, well, this person lost their life. Distress does not dismiss the requirement of obedience and holiness. And you will be severely tempted when you do go through distress to cast off restraint. Don't do it. Don't do it. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them. I don't know that I even have to exegete that, explain that. God warring against somebody is very one-sided. I will come to you soon and I will war against them with the sword of my mouth. I find that very interesting because the very same thing that he said in verse 12 to establish authority to speak this message and to comfort the church in Pergamum, you may be under the sword of Rome, but understand that I have the sword that endures forever. The word of the Lord endures forever. So you take comfort, church, and you listen to my message. Friends, understand that the same sword that comforts also cuts. The same Bible that we find comfort in is the same Bible that we will be judged by. Not enough to just take comfort from God's word and say, I'm a Christian. We have to actually live it. It is our sole authority of faith in practice because we may take comfort from it, but we'll also be judged by it. Paul makes that very clear in the opening chapters of the book of Romans. He who has an ear, 
Let him hear. That's a command. That's not an optional grab and take as you please. He who has an ear, you let him hear. You listen. That's an imperative. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I pointed this out the last two churches that we've seen. Who's speaking this message? Jesus is speaking this message. But who does he say is speaking the message? Jesus says it's the Spirit. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Three in one you see here. He who has an ear, let him hear. He's commanded to hear what the Spirit says to the churches, not just for Pergamum, but for Hillcrest as well. What the Spirit says to the churches. Now here's some rewards that are given here. These are spectacular rewards. To the one who conquers, who overcomes, who is victorious in this life, victorious to the end. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna. What is he talking about? He's even using mysterious language to talk about this mysterious reward. He says, hidden manna. This is not just any ordinary bread. That's what manna is. But manna specifically is what came down from heaven there in Exodus chapter 16 that fed the Israelites as they wandered through the wilderness. This was a supernatural gift of sustenance to the people of God in the midst of despair, in the midst of difficulty. But Jesus says to the one who overcomes in this life, he's going to get some of the hidden manna, some of the eternal sustenance. Because I think that this refers directly back to John chapter 6, verse 48 through 50. And I'll read to you what Jesus says about what real manna is, what real bread from heaven is. John 6, 48 through 50 says, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. So that can't be the hidden manna. That's no good. If they're eating that bread and they're dying, we don't want that bread. That bread's not eternal. But he says, I am the bread of life. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I want that bread. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The question is not what is the hidden manna as the reward. The question is who is the hidden manna? The one who overcomes in this life, who overcomes spiritual difficulty and opposition and oppression, not the one who is rescued out of it. No, the one who endures through it. The one who endures through it gets the everlasting man. It gets Jesus himself forever. What a wonderful gift given to those who persevere. Not only that, he says, and I will give him a white stone. I have no idea what that means. It give him a white stone. Maybe white there is in reference to holiness. It oftentimes is. It's something that sticks out. Maybe this is a, a gem. He's later on going to talk about being made a pillar in the house of God, in the temple of God. So this is something precious here. It's something that is holy. Other than that, I don't know what to tell you about it. But it's from God, so it must be good. And I will give him a white stone, but it's not just any kind of white stone. It actually has a a new name written on it. A new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Interestingly enough, that's not the only time that you hear that sentence. It's not the only time that you actually hear that phrase, even in the book of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 19, verse 12, it says that a certain someone actually has a name written on his thigh that nobody knows except for him who has it. It's Jesus. Jesus has one of those names that nobody knows. So church in Pergamum, you endure to the end, you persevere to the end, you're going to get something that Jesus has. You're going to be associated with Christ. You're going to have unique alignment with Jesus. What I find interesting about the messages to each one of these churches is that at the end of the message, there's a reward given For what kind of person? For the kind of Christian who doesn't just name the name of Christ, they actually persevere through difficulty. 
They actually have to overcome. They actually have to fight with their faith. They have to become victorious, and then they're given the reward. Friends, the kind of faith that Jesus demands of us, if we are to be the inheritors of heaven, the kind of faith that Jesus demands of us is the kind of faith that lives. It's the kind of faith that is persevering, and it's the kind of faith that preserves you. You think about these people who have lost everything. What did he say about the people in in Smyrna? He said, I know your extreme poverty, that you have nothing, but you are rich. What are they rich in? They're rich in faith, the kind of faith that preserves the heart, that says, no matter what I lose, no matter how difficult it becomes, no matter if even one of our own, a faithful witness, Antipas, is murdered in our own sight, I will hold on to God because my faith in Christ is preserving me in him. That kind of faith is rewarded. Only the kind of enduring faith. Only the kind of overcoming faith. Pray with me.